Jeremy Madsen. I'm the executive director of Greenbelt Alliance in the San Francisco Bay Area. We are the champion of the places that uh, make the Bay Area special, everything from our, our neighborhoods, our cities and towns, to the open spaces of our region. It's uh, uh, one of the most amazing natural settings that you could have of any metropolitan region in the world. It's uh, everything from redwood forests, to oak hills, to uh, oak studded hills, to the coast. Um, you know, amazing cities like San Francisco, Silicon Valley, uh, the uh, uh, education centers like UC Berkeley and Stanford, it is, it's really an incredible place. I think the concept of the urban growth boundary is actually pretty simple. Um, so the way they work, at least in California, is that uh, cities or counties will adopt a line and put it in uh, the, the general plan or what in other places are often called comprehensive plans. And that line is the line beyond which the city can't extend uh, municipal services. And, uh, and then oftentimes that's coupled with zoning inside the line that really promotes uh, infill and, uh, and, and uh, mixed use development. Outside the line aims at protecting natural resources and agricultural lands. We started putting the urban growth boundaries in place uh, about 20 years ago in the mid 90s. Um, since then, we do at Greenbelt Alliance do an analysis every few years of what we call lands at risk, uh, basically how to sprawl threaten open space. Um, in that period of time, the amount of open space under threat has dropped by about half, from about 600,000 acres to about 300,000 acres. They also, the urban growth boundaries, really set a clear line on, by setting a clear line on where growth can and can't go, it gives some certainty to developers as to, you know, where will, where will development be accepted and where won't it. And that's, you know, done great things for cities like, uh, uh, like San Jose, um, where, uh, you know, I often used to call San Jose California, Northern California's largest suburb. Um, but, uh, but since they adopted their urban growth boundary, they've really focused their growth, their new general plan, calls for accommodating another 120,000 uh, homes over the next 30 years and to do all of that within their existing urban footprint around what they're calling urban villages, uh, essentially old uh, commercial strips that are near transit that are going to become the, these vibrant neighborhoods and you know the urban growth boundary policy was a huge part in making that happen. Other communities have really used it to uh, you know, revitalize their downtowns because that's where they've said growth is going to go and in some cases they've even created a downtown from scratch after the adoption of an urban growth boundary. I think there's a lot of benefits uh, from an urban growth boundary that extend beyond uh, the natural resource conservation piece. Um, you know, it definitely promotes infill, which uh, you know, reduces car dependency. Um, so from a greenhouse gas uh, perspective, from building healthy neighborhoods where people have the option to, to walk, urban growth boundary is a tool. Um, from an economic development perspective, uh, at least in the Bay Area, our open spaces are one of the greatest assets that allows for us to attract uh, you know, the most attractive businesses, the most attractive workers to the community, the urban growth boundaries of policy to, uh, to help us attract those folks. From a municipal finance perspective, uh, it means that we're able, an urban growth boundary allows for infrastructure to be more contained, less costly to maintain, um, and, so, uh, and so the urban growth boundary is great from that perspective. And I think also even from a, to developers, again, it puts consistency in terms of uh, where development should and should not go. They know the rules, and so uh, urban growth boundaries work for developers, for landowners, et cetera. In terms of you know, recommendations, I'd probably say two or three things. I think the first is that the, the boundary needs to be determined you know, through a good community planning process, um, which builds a degree of consensus among you know, the environmental community, business leaders, uh, developers, farmers. I think the second is, um, you know, again, I think through a good planning process, you also draw the line in a way that will allow the community to accommodate uh, the growth over the next uh, you know, 20 years or so. And then I, I think the, the third thing, and this has actually in some ways been the hardest in the Bay Area, is that uh, ideally the urban growth boundaries would be created, I think, in a more, in a coordinated system between communities. So, um, you know, at least at a county level, um, ideally at a metropolitan region level. Uh, in the early days of, uh, uh, of the Bay Area putting in place urban growth boundaries, I think we did have situations of one community would establish one and that would just push the sprawl 
to another community that didn't have their boundary in place. Over the last few years, we've seen a lot more adopted. We've seen a lot more counties have every one of their community have an urban growth boundary. The region has gotten more in the business of helping to determine where growth should and should not go. So we've seen that problem go away. But ideally, from the start, uh, there'd be kind of a coordinated regional strategy.